Hi everybody, welcome to this webinar today. Just waiting for people to join us as they're probably popping in. We'll just give it a, a, a little bit of time for people to come into the room, or the webinar, I should say. Hi everyone, just as you're joining, we're just waiting for people to um, come online. We'll just give it a little bit of time. Okay, so might get started. Hello everybody, and thank you all for joining us for this webinar, which is part of our series of presentations that is being delivered on applying evidence in practice as part of the Comorbidity Project, which is funded by the Australian Government Department of Health. My name is Christina Morell. I am a Senior Research Fellow and Program Lead of Treatment and Translation in Complex Populations at the Matilda Centre for Research in Mental Health and Substance Use at the University of Sydney. Along with Erin Madden, who is a project officer on the Comorbidity Project, I have the great pleasure of facilitating this webinar, which is being presented by Associate Professor Kirsten Morley, Eva Louie, and Dr. Vicky Giannopoulos. Before we start, I'd like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the, to the traditional owners of the lands on which we're meeting, and of course, recognize that we are meeting across Australia today. The traditional owners of the lands that I'm currently on are the Gadigal and Wangal peoples of the Eora Nation, but I'd also like to pay my respects to other traditional owners of the lands across Australia for everybody else who is here today. I'd also like to recognize and acknowledge the many people with lived experience of mental illness and substance use, as well as their families and carers, many of whom have generously contributed to the development of the comorbidity guidelines, as well as our other resources. I know that everybody here has probably spent uh, a lot of time on Zoom and I probably don't need to be saying this, but just in case, uh, I'd like to quickly go over a couple of things before we start. So first of all, to let you know, uh, everybody who's attending the live webinar today is in listen only mode, which means that we can't see or hear you. So I just want to draw your attention to the Q&A and chat buttons on your screen. Please feel free to click on the Q&A button and type in a question if you have any for uh, our panelists today at any time during the talk today. And we will have some time for discussion and we'll be going through as many of those as we can. If you have any comments or anything that is not for our presenters, please use the chat button. If you experience any technical issues during the webinar today, you can contact Zoom support um, or access the recording of the webinar, which we'll be making available as well as a PDF handouts of the slides. So those will both be available to download from the website on your screen there. If you find the Zoom chat distracting, you can have a play around with the settings on your end to disable what messages that you see. So to do this, you need to go to the Zoom desktop app. If you have it installed, click on the settings wheel on the top right hand corner of the screen and then select chat on the navigation menu. So you should be able to change what messages that you see by changing your push notifications or even your do not disturb times. But it might take a little bit of fiddling around to get the settings right. So I've put the Zoom link to more information on the screen there in case you'd like to follow up on this and have a play around with it later. And ironically, Erin will be posting it in the chat. So we have an exciting series of webinars over the next few months. You can find out more about these and also register for our upcoming webinars at our website. The link to do that is on screen. And thank you very much to those of you who have been giving us suggestions for future webinars at our end of webinar survey. We do ask for suggestions, so please let us know if you have any other topics you'd like to see as part of this series, and we'll see what we can do. Today's webinar is focusing on building comorbidity capacity in AOD services. And just to let you know before we start that the actual presentation section of this webinar was pre-recorded, but we do have Kirsten, Eva and Vicky here for our live discussion, which we will be having at the end of the recording. If you'd like to access the PDF handout for the presentation and follow along, you can do that. And Erin will be putting the link to um, download the PDF in the chat box now. And it's now my very great pleasure to introduce our presenters for today, Associate Professor Kirsten Morley, Eva Louie and Dr. Vicky Giannopoulos. Kirsten is an Associate Professor at the University of Sydney in the Discipline of Addiction Medicine, where her focus is on the investigation of treatment and correlates of addiction and psychological comorbidities using both neuropsychopharmacological and psychosocial frameworks. Eva is a PhD candidate at the University of Sydney in the Discipline of Addiction Medicine. And Vicky is a Senior Clinical Psychologist at Drug Health Services at Royal Prince Alfred Hospital. Kirsten, Eva and Vicky worked collaboratively as part of a multidisciplinary team to develop and implement pathways to comorbidity care 
a multimodal training program for the management of co-occurring mental disorders in alcohol and other drug settings. I'm so very grateful that Kirsten, Eva and Vicky were able to be here, um, take the time and share their knowledge today. So without uh, hearing too much more from me, I'm going to hand over to them for us to get started. Before we begin, we would like to acknowledge the tradition of custodianship and law of the country on which the University of Sydney campuses stand. We pay our respects to those who have cared and continue to care for country. Hi, my name is Associate Professor Kirsten Morley and I'm from the Faculty of Medicine and Health, Specialty of Addiction Medicine at the University of Sydney and also the Edith Collins Centre which is a translational research centre in alcohol, drugs and toxicology at the Royal Prince Alfred Hospital. Today, um, together with my colleagues, Dr. Vicky Giannopoulos and PhD candidate Eva Louie, uh, we're going to present to you the Pathways to Comorbidity Care Project, where we are looking at building comorbidity capacity in alcohol and drug services and what works. So firstly, I will begin by giving a, a brief introduction to our project, and then Eva will discuss the results from the project. And then we have Vicky who will then draw on the two main findings and we'll discuss the two main facilitators that we found in this project, which we hope will be of interest to you. Now this project was funded by the New South Wales Health Translational Research Grant Scheme. And our, we had our wonderful partners at the Matilda Centre. Uh, it was also facilitated by uh, fellowships given to myself, a New South Wales Health Translational Research Fellowship, um, an RTP scholarship for a PhD uh, to Eva and a practitioner fellowship to Paul Haver. And some great partnerships with uh, several LHDs across New South Wales. Now we were really fortunate to receive the contributions of a lot of amazing researchers and clinicians on this project. Um, and you can see that they are listed up, up there um, on the screen, as well as um, many local health districts across New South Wales. So Sydney Local Health District, South West Sydney, Central Coast, Hunter New England Local Health District and also the Mid North Coast Local Health District. So just to provide a brief background and rationale uh, for our project, um, treating comorbid drug and alcohol and mental health disorders, as you know, is, is challenging. Um, many of our team have been working in drug and alcohol settings for uh, many, many years. Um, and if we're going to have the best chance of treating comorbidity effectively, clinical research into what works with this population needs to be lined up with clinical practice. However, what we often find is that there's a gap between clinical research and clinical practice. So we are aware of the problems associated with treating comorbidity. We know that it's common and in drug and alcohol settings, we know that um, up to 90% of people who access substance use treatment also experience comorbid mental health problems. Um, we know there's uh, poor outcomes associated with comorbidities, such as greater symptom severity, less quality of life, um, reliance on treatment. And there are also systemic issues related to the segregated nature of many mental health and substance use services and the lack of sustainable solutions available. However, we also have good solutions such as the National Comorbidity Guidelines that have come from the Matilda Centre and we know about evidence-based approaches to comorbidity. Integrated Care aims to identify and implement evidence-based management of both the drug and alcohol use and the mental health condition within one service and this model therefore overcomes problems associated with segregated treatment and non-cohesive treatment plans. The real problem is how to close the gap. We set out to do this by training or creating a training program called the Pathways to Comorbidity Care, 
program and it was designed specifically for drug and alcohol workers. Um, my team and my colleagues, um, we, we're based in drug and alcohol settings, um, so that's where this um, training program was, um, was focused on these clinicians. Um, and the aim was to upskill clinicians um, in the integrated care model. So just to emphasize again that um, our training program, um, the locus of care is in the drug and alcohol settings, in the drug and alcohol services. So looking in that first quadrant um, in category three, you can see where um, usually the mental use disorder um, can be less severe, the substance use disorder more severe compared to category two. Uh, for example, in the mental health services, where often you'll find that the, the mental disorder might be more severe and the substance use disorder less severe, um, generally speaking. So our focus was very uh, specifically um, in the drug and alcohol settings. So what did we do? Um, so our team, um, in collaboration uh, with the Matilda Centre, put together a training package, and this included um, a Pathways to Comorbidity portal, which was a website that included comorbidity assessment tools, handouts, treatment manuals, and referral sources. We also had a seminar day, and on the seminar day, there were webinars that were uh, provided, and these address specific areas of comorbidity. Um, so in terms of management techniques and the presenting problems, and then we had um, a clinical supervision component, and this was um, tele supervision. So it was conducted over the telephone um, by our wonderful clinical supervisor, Vicky Jeanopoulos, who will be speaking um, at the end of this presentation. Um, and then we also had uh, clinical champions uh, that ran group workshops. And so you can see here, just in terms of the time, timeline, um, it, it ran over a nine month period. And our online component, the PCC portal, uh, was open and running throughout the entire period. The first three months of the program involved um, the seminar day and then the middle three months involved uh, the clinical supervision and the clinical workshops and the clinical champion. We also studied both how effective the training was in improving clinician self-efficacy, clinical practice behaviours um, compared to a control group who did not receive this training. And we got feedback from the clinicians about the quality of the training package uh, via our qualitative research methods. Um, and whether or not the, the package was delivered in a, in a helpful way. So you can see here, we did some um, measurements at baseline and then also follow up and we compared the active versus control and we did file reviews uh, to look at um, any changes in the identification of comorbid uh, mental disorders um, in, the, in the drug and alcohol settings and also um, management, so treatment and referrals. So we implemented uh, this PCC package, the training package, um, multimodal training package um, in uh, several sites. So we had Metro sites, so an active site being uh, RPA, the Sydney Local Health District, um, which is an outpatient based service. Um, and then a control site also um, in, a, in a Metro area uh, being Liverpool Hospital then we also uh, had a site in the outro meta, metro in a regional, um, which was the Central Coast Local Health District. And um, so we, Gosford was our active site and Wyong was our control. And then uh, we went regional and we also implemented the PCC training package um, in Port Macquarie um, in the uh, mid-north coast local health district. And uh, Tari was our control in the Hunter New England local health district. And overall, um, there were 35 uh, clinicians enrolled in the program. And each of the active sites uh, had a, um, a clinical champion. 
So now I'm going to hand it over, um, hand over the talk to Eva Louie, who um, is a PhD candidate and this project um, makes up part of her um, PhD thesis and she was also the study coordinator on this project. And she's going to um, give you a brief rundown of our findings, uh, followed by Vicky, who was our amazing clinical supervisor, um, who will um, discuss some of the, the, t the two highlights uh, in terms of uh, the, the two components that we think um, were the most helpful um, in implementing uh, this program. Thank you. Thanks, Kirsten. As Kirsten mentioned, we administered a questionnaire at baseline, so before the PCC training took place. And we did this because we wanted to get a really clear picture of who the clinicians were and of what their current practices were regarding the management of comorbidity. Across the entire sample of participants, the majority were psychologists, followed by counsellors and social workers and then nurses, and the majority were female. The measures that we used, you can see they're listed on the right. Self-efficacy and comorbidity counselling, comorbidity knowledge, evidence-based practice attitudes, and organisational readiness for change were all moderate at baseline, and attitudes towards therapist manuals were low to moderate. However, most services were only operating at an addiction only to dual diagnosis capable level. Dual diagnosis capability is a benchmark measure of service provision that refers to the services capacity to meet the needs of patients who have dual diagnosis. There are three classifications um, of the measure ranging from addiction only to dual diagnosis capable to dual diagnosis enhanced, which is the gold standard. So we also found that 29% of clinicians were practicing non-evidence-based therapies with their patients. So on the basis of this assessment, we determined that there was some need for training in comorbidity management. And so we proceeded with the PCC program. So to assess practice change, we evaluated clinical notes before and after the intervention of the package. We found a significant increase in the percentage of clinical files demonstrating identification and a trend for management of comorbidity in the group of clinicians who received the PCC training, but not for the control group. So the PC training group, you can see represented by the blue line and the control group is the orange line. We also found that the percentage of clinicians who demonstrated comorbidity practice management at least 50% of the time was significantly greater following the PCC program, but not for the control group. Taken together, we found evidence to suggest that the PCC package helped improve the identification of comorbidity and increase the percentage of clinicians who demonstrated management of comorbidity at least 50% of the time. We also found a significant improvement in self-efficacy in clinicians who participated in the PCC program. This was especially true um, of two aspects of self-efficacy. Um, those, those included the assessment, treatment and planning and referral skills and co-occurring disorder skills. So in this slide, the red line refers to the PCC sites or those who um, went through the PCC program and the grey line is the control site. So it's quite a substantial finding. And interestingly, these findings, they kind of fit with the clinical practice findings. So with this study, because we're looking at bridging that gap between research and practice, it was really important to not only just evaluate whether the training package changes clinicians' behaviour, but to also try and find out from clinicians how they evaluated the package and how they evaluated the implementation. So that's what we did as well. And when we asked clinicians about the package, overall, they rated the supervision as the most helpful component of the training, followed by the 
clinical champion run workshops. The seminar day and the PCC portal were perceived as less helpful. When we asked clinicians to tell us what they thought about the clinical supervision, 89% of the thoughts expressed by clinicians about supervision were favourable. 71% of these opinions were based on the quality of the supervisor. 47% were based on the clinical utility of the information discussed in supervision. And 47% were related to the structured nature of the supervision. Unfavourable opinions of supervision were due to this, just the time constraints. When we asked clinicians to tell us what they thought about the clinical champion run workshops, 82% stated that they believed these workshops were a good idea. 60% asserted that the workshops provided a forum where they could pass on information to each other, which they enjoyed. And 45% enjoyed the opportunity that this forum gave them to discuss difficulties that they had been having in managing comorbidity. Some areas for improvement that the clinicians mentioned included the seminar day and the PCC portal. So in terms of the seminar day, while clinicians endorsed the expertise of the presenters and they affirmed the quality of the videos, 50% of clinicians would have preferred to have had the presenters there in person. And um, there was a perception that the content of the seminars needed to be geared much more towards clinical practice rather than theory, which actually was a really big, really big lesson that we learned um, from our side of the fence, I suppose. So in terms of the PCC portal, while many clinicians saw a benefit to being able to download information with relative ease, it wasn't widely utilised. So clinicians reported that they had a preference for face-to-face -face resources and training modes. We also asked clinicians to tell us what they thought about the PCC, how the PCC package was implemented. And we had them highlight the particular barriers of facilitators to the implementation. The barriers that they included, you don't see on the slide, but Basically, it was a perceived lack of organisational incentives and rewards. Um, and some clinicians had sort of personal beliefs that um, prevented them from engaging in the PCC program. So the facilitators identified by clinicians included intervention characteristics, such as the belief in the credibility of the intervention source, like for example, a strong belief that the clinical supervisor had the expertise necessary to provide support and feedback. Clinicians also noted the quality of the evidence behind the approach and they thought that the intervention, it wasn't too complex and they appreciated the design and packaging of the intervention. Inner setting factors or factors within the organisation that were viewed as facilitators included the belief that a positive learning climate was fostered through the implement throughout the implementation of the PCC program. For example, the workshops, the clinicians thought that the workshops provided a forum in which they could pass on information to one another. And leadership engagement um, was also seen as the strength of the implementation. Outer setting factors refer to influential factors external to the organisation, such as you know, policies and incentives, things like that, or um, things like patient needs. And the consideration of patient needs and resources were identified as a particular strength of the implementation. Characteristics of individual clinicians also contributed to the success of the implementation, such as clinicians' knowledge and beliefs about the intervention and their self-efficacy. Finally, clinicians thought that the implementation process was enhanced by the use of clinical champions. So that's all I'm going to say about the research side of things. Um, apart from to say that it was such a valuable experience for us to actually be, include the clinicians in that process of the research and to 
find out that feedback from them about how they perceived the package and um, the implementation. So I think that Vicky is now going to tell you a bit more about um, what happened during supervision and about the clinical champions and the workshops. So I'll hand over to her. Thanks, Vicky. Thanks, Eva. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Vicky Janopoulos. I'm a senior clinical psychologist uh, from the Sydney Local Health District Drug Health Counselling Service. And I was fortunate enough to have worked on the Pathways to Comorbidity Care program as the clinical supervisor, providing all the individual uh, clinical supervision to the clinicians who were enrolled in the study. So all the active site participants in the study received monthly telephone supervision for myself. So today I'll be talking to you about the clinical supervision component I provided in the study. But before I tell you about that, I'll be talking to you about the role of the clinical champions in the study. So as Eva mentioned before, the role of the clinical champions was found to be absolutely crucial in the implementation process. And I'll tell you a bit more about it now. What do we know about clinical champions? Well, we know from a systematic review of clinical champions working in comorbid mental health and substance use, that clinical champions can help in a number of ways with implementation of evidence-based practice. Firstly, we know that they help to make sure that evidence-based practice are initiated quickly. As we all know, that this can actually take a really long time in clinical practice. Clinical champions are responsible for providing education and training in the new treatments. So it's essential that they have to be familiar and have knowledge of these new treatments themselves. And given that, when we're trying to implement new treatments or practices, clinicians' motivation will naturally fluctuate. You know, some days clinicians will be super keen to use new evidence-based practices and other days they won't be at all interested. So this makes the clinical champion's role almost like that of a cheerleader or a coach where they're constantly encouraging and motivating clinicians to use evidence-based practices. So clinical champions also play a pivotal role in helping overcome systems barriers during any implementation process. And this can include things like high caseloads, staff shortage, high staff turnover, lack of access to resources such as treatment manuals or training. So the clinical champion can feedback any such issues to and from management, and that can sometimes help with the implementation process. So what makes a good clinical champion? Well, they say that personal interest, commitment, confidence, passion and dedication are essential. And we know that comorbidity management is an area in which most clinicians report low confidence or low self-efficacy for its treatment. So the clinical champion plays a very important role in helping to increase clinical confidence in clinicians. So we basically want to improve confidence in clinicians' ability to screen, assess, treat and manage comorbidity using evidence-based practices and using the national comorbidity guidelines as a guide. So clinical champions, they need to be encouraging the update of evidence-based practices, such as increasing clinicians' familiarity with new practices and comorbidity guidelines. They can only achieve these things if they're able to communicate effectively with their colleagues. So good communications are absolutely essential in a good clinical champion. Cha uh, clinical champions also have to be willing to be a mentor. There's no point forcing someone to be a clinical champion. You know, they have to actually be wanting to do this in order to succeed in the role. You know, if they're forced into this role, by their manager, for instance, 
you know, it's a recipe for disaster because they need to have some degree of interest in being a mentor. Furthermore, they also need to be respected by their work colleagues and seen as credible and approachable in order to actually succeed as a clinical champion. Clinicians are not likely to take advice from or approach a champion for clinical advice if they aren't personable or respected in their team. So these features of a good clinical champion need to be considered before selecting clinical champions in your workplace. Usually clinical champions are senior clinicians, sometimes they're managers or team leaders, sometimes they're physicians, but more often they're not, particularly in comorbidity management or in drug and alcohol services, they tend to be psychologists or social workers. Usually they're selected by management for the role, usually due to their experience um, in delivering evidence-based practice. And unfortunately, they tend not to have formal training in being a clinical champion. So they kind of have to wing it. <laughs> and just to complicate further, um, there's usually not one universal job description for a clinical champion. So their roles and responsibilities are often quite unclear and vague. So in the literature, we only found about half the studies had some sort of job description. And the most common was something like assist with implementation plan and provide formal and informal support for staff. So how do we use clinical champions in the pathway to comorbidity care project? So as mentioned before by Eva, the clinical champions played a significant role in the implementation of evidence-based practice in the project. So in the project, each local health district had one clinical champion who usually volunteered to take on the role and, usually, and had to have their manager's uh, approval to do so. So in the study, the clinical champions were a senior counsellor, a senior clinical psychologist and a senior psychologist. Clinical champions were trained in how to chair weekly clinical workshops, which ran for 12 weeks. And I'll talk to you a bit more about this in a minute. But basically in each workshop, clinicians um, who participated in the PCC project were required to take turns in presenting comorbid clinical cases. So each clinical case presented required the clinician to provide clinical information using a template that we developed, which I'll show you in a minute. And the clinical champion was required to encourage the team to come up with a treatment plan and strategies using the uh, national comorbidity guidelines and to provide feedback to the clinician who presented. So basically in these workshops, um, the champion's role was to encourage everyone to come up with solutions and treatment plans and um, you know, strategies once a case formulation had been presented using the national comorbidity guidelines as a guide. So each clinical champion uh, received about two hours of individual training before commencing their role from myself. And in that training, I sort of provided them with written information about their roles, their responsibilities, um, strategies on how to incorporate the national comorbidity guidelines into the workshops, um, tips on how to manage difficult situations which might arise. For instance, you know, um, staff who were not motivated to present um, cases, um, as well as more challenging situations, such as managing clinicians who might actually be resistant to using evidence-based practices full stop. So overall, the clinical champion's role was mainly to encourage clinicians in the team to use evidence-based practice using the national comorbidity guidelines as a guide. So once again, uh, the champion was almost like a cheerleader um, and a coach, coaching uh, clinicians in how to use evidence-based practice with comorbid clients. Um, 
So this is the workshop case presentation performer that um, I mentioned before. So clinicians were required to complete this before attending the workshop and present this to the team. Um, so remember the workshops were chaired by the clinical champion on a weekly basis. So typically one to two cases would be presented in a one hour workshop run on a weekly basis. And this went 12 weeks. So clinicians will take turns in presenting a case in the 12 week period. So with each clinician in the team presenting at least once to the team in the 12 week period. So typically um, drug and alcohol clinicians working in New South Wales Health would be used to presenting cases in like clinical review meetings or team meetings using similar headings as you can see in the performer. Um, things like, you know, demographics, drug and alcohol use history, um, you know, psychosocial issues, forensic history, treatment issues, etc. But they may not be used to presenting information on mental health history. So this is where we really wanted to emphasise um, a new way of thinking, of actually incorporating mental health history um, into the case presentation and not just history and diagnoses, um, their previous treatments, suicidality, aggression, risk factors. Also, most importantly, some information on the impact of the mental health condition on their substance use and vice versa. Stages of change for changing the mental health problem was also important because we all know that can be different to the patient's um, stage of change for changing their substance use problem. And importantly, level of insight into the mental health problem. So the clinical champion's role in these weekly workshops was to encourage the team to come up with recommendations and an action plan, as you can see down the bottom there. And the clinical champion's role was to encourage the team to come up with some good recommendations and document these using the National Comorbidity Guidelines as a guide. So when a case would be presented, you know, the, it wouldn't be unusual for the champion to whip out a hard copy of the Comorbidity Guidelines, turn to the section which might have been relevant. For instance, if a case was presented about a client with an alcohol problem who possibly had bipolar disorder, they would then go to the section on bipolar disorder read out the brief recommendations that are summarised there in the guidelines and the team will decide which of those recommendations will best be used um, to be followed up by the clinician in future sessions. So basically at the end of the workshop the clinical champion will document uh, these recommendations and give a copy back to the clinician who presented with the feedback in a timely fashion. And usually, like I said before, the clinical champion would have a hard copy of the National Comorbidity Guidelines with them in the workshops, so they could refer to the best practice section in there that was relevant to them. So the nice thing about the Comorbidity Guidelines is they're set up in a fashion so that you know, they're separated by specific disorders. So you can go in. So if you've got someone with an eating disorder, you go into that section, you can get a nice little summary at the beginning about best practice um, recommendations, or you can read the whole thing. In the clinical workshops, they would usually just read the brief summary, which summarised the main evidence-based practice. And as a team, they will decide which strategies they would use. So that's uh, the role of the clinical champions. And now I'm going to talk to you about um, clinical supervision and its role in the implementation of evidence-based practice in comorbidity care uh, during the PCC project. So let's start with what supervision is and what it isn't. Um, but the, it's, we know it's the most widely used technique increasing the chances of implementing evidence-based practice and in turn sort of maintaining quality care 
So we know it's not clinical case review that's different and it's not performance review. Instead, it's best defined as a social influence process that occurs over time in which the supervisor participates with the supervisees to ensure quality clinical care. And that's the most important line in that definition is what we're looking at is improving clinical care provided to patients presenting with comorbidity. And that was the basic theme of the PCC project. So in this study, um, we wanted to ensure that clinicians working in drug and alcohol services were providing clients with comorbid conditions the most evidence-based and up-to-date integrated care. And clinical supervision was one way we thought we could look into that further. We know that the most effective components of clinical supervision are the use of multimodal teaching methods, having a clear agenda for each supervision session, giving clear and specific feedback to clinicians, and using a collaborative, a collaborative approach during supervision. So there's ample evidence from the mental health field that supervision increases the chance of any evidence-based practice being put into practice following training. But research in the drug and alcohol field is limited, unfortunately. But we can pretty much assume that the same would probably apply to mental health as it would to drug and alcohol. So research with drug and alcohol counsellors, though, has found that supervision increases their self-efficacy for managing comorbidity and for using CBT skills. And they've also found that higher self-efficacy in drug and alcohol counsellors predicts higher fidelity. So in a nutshell, we know that the clinical champions and the clinical supervisor play an important role in the implementation process. So in the PCC project, we used a CBT model of supervision because it's got the most evidence to support its efficacy and also because it made sense to use um, CBT for comorbidity because um, basically all the evidence-based practice suggests the use of CBT strategies. The whole purpose of the supervision was to encourage clinicians to use evidence-based practice. And I basically did this by encouraging them at every opportunity during supervision sessions um, using the national comorbidity guidelines. So we wanted clinicians by the end of the training to be able to screen, assess, identify common comorbid mental health conditions and to provide ongoing management and in some cases treatment for the comorbidity from an alcohol and drug setting using sort of an integrated model of care. So clinicians in a nutshell were encouraged to sort of be more aware of comorbidity and to use an integrated approach. So what did we do during the supervision? So supervision was offered by telephone as we were covering three uh, very different local health districts across the state of New South Wales. And most clinicians found the telephone contact was okay. Like they didn't need to travel, it was convenient for them. Um, and all clinicians had access to a telephone, whereas video conferencing facilities were not always available in some of the rural health sites. Um, you know, so all clinicians, had met me, the supervisor, face to face prior to commencing the telephone supervision. And we'd usually done that once. And research suggests that this actually helps with the supervision sessions if you're going to do telephone supervision to actually have met your supervisor face to face beforehand. Supervision was for an hour per month which is typically what um, New South Wales Health offers to its drug and alcohol staff anyway, um, which is an hour a month. So clinicians were provided with 
written information about their roles and responsibilities as well as the supervisor's roles and responsibilities before supervision started. So things that I documented and gave to uh, clinicians were things about the confidential nature of supervision, uh, you know, when confidentiality would need to be broken, for example, if there was evidence of serious misconduct, which there wasn't, thank goodness, and how records of supervision would be kept. And just some basic information about how to prepare for supervision sessions um, and what was required of the clinician and the supervisor. So clinicians were required to present a total of three different clinical cases over the three supervision sessions. So it's like a case per session, basically. Clinicians were told not to present a case already presented at clinical champion led workshops. So not to repeat one. They could present uh, a case of a client with any comorbid mental health condition, um, as well as one with a suspected mental health condition. They did not actually need to have a formal diagnosis. And prior to each supervision session, each clinician was required to forward to me by email the client's de-identified counselling electronic medical records and to complete a one-page performer outlining certain clinical issues for each client and send it to me. And I'll show you that performer in a second. Uh, the supervisor then, at the end of the one hour telephone session, would provide some written feedback to participants immediately um, after each session by email. And most importantly, the feedback that the supervisor would give, that's myself, was linked to the recommendations made in the National Comorbidity Guidelines. So the beauty of the National Comorbidity Guidelines is they're set out in beautifully neat sections so you can easily look at the recommendations if you're in a hurry. Um, and the supervisor's role in this instance was to use them as part of the supervision process. So looking at what do we do with this client? You know, what are our options? So let's look at the guidelines. What do they recommend? Should we try this, that? this one, and then we'd come up with a plan from there. So using them as a guide. So I'd refer clinicians to the relevant sections of the comorbidity guidelines and just highlight, you know, which sections were relevant to them. So this is the performer that I used in clinical supervision. Now it looks familiar because it's exactly like the one used in the clinical workshops. Um, with the clinical champion, the only difference is um, at the end, the recommendation and action plan, I'm writing that, not the, the champion. So it's, it's basically the point of having something like this is to structure supervision section, sessions, because we know that um, for supervision to be effective, sessions need to be structured with a clear agenda. And also it helps to provide like a quick formulation about the patient. And, you know, it's got the same information that it does for the champion lead workshops. So you've got, you know, mental health history, drug and alcohol use history, demographics, treatment summary, and clinical issues, among sort of other things as well. So we found some fantastic results in the PCC study with regards to the clinical supervision as we did with the clinical champion. So we found that um, the main improvement following supervision was a significant increase in clinician self-efficacy for treating comorbid conditions. So in comparison to the control group who didn't actually get any supervision or champions or any treatment, um, you know, Active sites who received the supervision reported great increases in self-efficacy over time. We also audited all clinicians' clinical notes for three months prior and three months after the PCC project finished. So we wanted to see whether clinicians documented um, increased rates of screening, assessing, managing, treating and referring comorbid case, uh, patients 
as a result of the PCC project. So we wanted to know if they became more comorbidity aware as a result of the comorbidity training. What we found after auditing thousands of notes <laughs> was that there was, you know, huge variation in quantity and quality of clinical notes in drug and alcohol counsellors across the state. You know, some clinicians would write copious notes for each treatment session, you know, some going for 135 lines, whereas others wrote, you know, three words, counselling continued, you know. It's so the variation was enormous. Um, but we wanted to audit notes to check rates of documentation of assessing, screening, treating and managing comorbidity before and after training. And we hope to find like an increase in rates of documenting comorbidity post-training. Fortunately, we did indeed find an increase in documentation post-training. Um, and in comparison to that control group who did not receive any um, training, um, there were increased rates of documenting comorbidity. Um, so screening, assessing, treating and referring. Uh, this looks very complicated, but this is the, the note auditing tool that we used. So for every clinical note written by a clinician, whether they're in the PCC project or the control group, we basically uh, scored their note depending on whether there was any mental health assessment, whether there was any mention of a mood or psychiatric condition, whether there was any mental health screening conducted, and whether there was any evidence of treatment strategies or management of comorbidity. So obviously they got two points for each item if they could provide evidence of that in their notes and zero points if there was no evidence of it. This is something you can use in your own clinical practice if you're looking at um, implementing comorbidity. So it's quite a useful tool and it's very nice and basic and simple and quick. So after the PCC project uh, finished, we wanted to ensure that clinicians continued to identify and manage comorbidity um, in their day-to-day -day practice in the drug and alcohol service. And most importantly, we wanted them to document it. Um, one way of sort of enhancing implementation long term was to create an actual clinical note template which had embedded in it a section on comorbidity. And that way we were encouraging all clinicians to use the template for every treatment session. And this is something you can also do. Um, and if you are working from a drug and alcohol service, is to ensure that your clinical notes do have a specific section on comorbidity and its management. Although we had good evidence to support uh, the fact that supervision helped with implementation of evidence-based practice uh, for comorbidity, we know that there are numerous barriers to implementation that have been documented in the literature. And they're important for you to consider these when you start thinking about using uh, supervision in your practice. So sometimes organisational factors can be a huge barrier. Um, for instance, there tends to be a lack of supervisors trained in evidence-based practice um, who can actually successfully deliver evidence-based practice. And there's a tendency for some services to use line managers or team leaders as supervisors, and often they don't have training in supervision. A lot of organisations will also say they don't have the funding or finances to pay for supervision. And at the same time, clinicians will often say they don't have time for supervision. They're just too busy. Their caseloads are too high. There are also a lot of clinician factors that are barriers to implementation. For example, sometimes clinicians will have really negative attitudes about supervision um, and or evidence-based practices in general. And that can be a huge barrier to implementation. Sometimes clinicians will be fearful of supervision. They often muddle it up with line management um, and often the boundaries are quite blurred in terms of confidentiality. So that can also feed into their negative attitudes. So that needs to be considered as well when starting supervision. Some will just fear change. So if you're trying to implement 
a new way of doing things, some clinicians will just be fearful of changing the way they've been practicing. Um, and that can sometimes be a huge barrier. Lack of confidence, so low self-efficacy can also be a barrier to implementation, as well as another common one, which can sometimes creep up, is clinicians who actually um, use opposing models of practice, which often tend to be non-evidence-based practice. So it's important to consider all these barriers before thinking about implementing supervision. And that's all we had uh, for you today. And we're just ready for any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. And particularly interesting uh, to hear how you use the comorbidity guidelines in such a practical way as a tool in clinical supervision and also in the clinical champion workshops. So we have had some questions come through and we do have a little bit of time, not heaps of time, just a little bit of time to go through some of them. And I'm going to start us off with asking either Eva or Vicky. Um, Eva, you mentioned that one of the most helpful components identified by your participants was clinical supervision. So I'd be really interested to hear either from you yeah, or Vicky, whether you had any information about whether people who did find this as the most useful component, whether they had access to clinical supervision before they took part in the project or in the study. And if so, do you know what it was about um, the particular supervision that you were providing people with, uh, what it was that they found so useful? Um, I think this probably is one for Vicky, um, because she, uh, we didn't ask questions about prior supervision, but uh, she would have discussed that. What do you say to that, Vicky? Yeah, look, um, we didn't really assess in great detail their prior supervision, but it did come up um, and a lot of or almost everyone was receiving supervision at the same time as the supervision we provided as part of PCC. But what they liked the most about our supervision is it was quite evidence based and structured. And although it was time limited, um, the agenda was quite clear um, and we had a very specific focus and that was to enhance comorbidity care. Yeah. And I know that, you know, you mentioned that I think it was 12 sessions. Is that right? As part of the project? Yes, um, it was three uh, supervision sessions over three months. Sorry, right, yes. Yep, so it was about an hour a month for three months. Mm -hmm. um, and usually they, they'd have to prepare beforehand um, and submit all the information before the session. Um, so it was quite structured. Um, with a very clear sort of goal of presenting comorbid cases and getting feedback specifically on comorbidity care. Yeah. And have people who are in the study, have they uh, been able to have, do you know if they have continued their clinical supervision with somebody other than you <laughs> after the study finished? We didn't really um, check that a great deal after the study finished. Um, we were more interested like during the study, what was happening, but mm. most or well, all of our staff were New South Wales health employees. So they do have to have clinical supervision, um, usually an hour a month, which is what I provided um, as part of their employment. So it's recommended by New South Wales health that they do have clinical supervision an hour per month. Um, if they're working in drug and alcohol as counsellors. Um, but what that supervision entails could be anything. It could be in a group, it could be individual. Um, it may or may not look at comorbidity care. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, and also had another question about whether you had a sense um, mentioning about the increased rates of documenting mental health conditions in files. Do you know whether that would relate to an increase in the capacity of clinicians to be able to identify comorbidity in their clients? Or do you think it's more complex than that, you know, reflecting a greater understanding of the need to document complexity or um, maybe taking more time over clinical notes and other things? Yeah, look, we found that um, one of the, the key changes was they were more comorbidity aware, the clinicians who took part in this project. So we're actually making them sort of think more about assessing, treating, referring on for comorbidity, which may not be something they were used to doing in an integrated fashion. Mm -hmm. And we 
although we didn't specifically tell clinicians to add this to their notes, we noticed that there was a huge improvement in documentation following the PCC training um, in terms of them actually writing more about comorbidity because their whole way of thinking about managing the patient's care changed. Um, instead of just being focused purely on the addiction, um, they were kind of starting to think about mental health and the impact the two have on each other. And that was quite evident from their clinical notes following the training and that there was a lot more information in their notes about comorbidity care. Yeah. So I think it was about changing the whole way they think about everything. Yeah, and some of the things I noticed that you had in the performers were thinking about other uh, factors that would influence what, you know, what's going on with the person. So considering, um, you know, the whole person, I guess, like where they're living, if they have a job, you know, those kinds of things that we talk about, I guess, in the comorbidity guidelines. That's right, yeah. Right. Well, we've kind of run out of time, as we always do, but um, there are some more questions we didn't get to. And I think um, if I put our email addresses up on screen and if people are happy to email you know, Erin and we'll pass them on to you. Is that all right for you to get back to? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that's awesome. great. Thank you. Always run out of time. Um, but just before we finish, I just wanted to quickly put up the guidelines information about those that you mentioned. And if anybody wants to find out more information about these or our other resources, you can do this at our website, which is comorbidityguidelines.org.au. Uh, and you can download a copy as a PDF of the guidelines and also find out information about our free online training program, which is based on the guidelines contents. And wanted to thank you again for having joined us for this webinar. If you're interested in viewing this recording, registering for our upcoming webinars, or having a look at our library of previously recorded webinars, you can do this at the website there. The next webinar in our series is on the 21st of October, and that will be on shared decision making. And that will be followed by one on the 23rd of November on multiple behavioral change. And on the 9th of December, we'll have one on trauma informed care in AOD settings. And until then, thank you again for joining us. And thank you so much again, Kirsten, Eva, and Vicky. And please, everybody, enjoy the rest of your day and stay safe. <laughs> Thank you. Bye.